Welcome back to our video module on mechanics of materials. Today I'd like to revisit our beam problem in three dimensions. We know that if we have some sort of stress in the x direction that's going to cause a deformation. That deformation will affect not only the width but also the depth. What happens with the volume? Today we're going to talk about how the volume of a beam changes when a stress is applied, known as dilation. To get us started, I'd like to draw a quick 3D cube, and we're going to apply a force to this cube, uh, we'll say in, in yellow, and we'll call it force in the x direction, and right here also another force in the x direction. And we're going to say that the Poisson ratio in this case is zero. So it really only expands in the axial direction. If we say that, now the thing we're really interested in is not so much the change in volume, but the change in volume per unit volume. Now let's pretend for a minute that our cube has a length of one, so that should make things kind of easy. We define this change of volume per unit volume. This is the dilation. And we can think of it as kind of like a volumetric strain, if you will. Now in this one case, we know that the only change is due to this delta at the bottom. But we're not concerned with delta, we're concerned about the change in the length per unit length, and we know that that is the strain in the x direction. One can also imagine that we're going to apply some sort of horizontal force, you know, force y in this direction, force y here, and now the cube is going to expand in this direction. So the total strain is going to be this strain right down here, plus the strain in the y direction. And because these strains are so much smaller than the actual length of the sides, we find them to be additive rather than multiplicative, and we end up with a simple equation for the dilation of a cube. I should make one clarification here, and that's when we said a volumetric strain, rather than using epsilon, we use E. Next, we can combine these two equations, and we find that the dilation equals one minus two nu over E times sigma x plus sigma y plus sigma z, or the stresses in each of the three directions. This is the equation for the dilation or change in volume per unit volume of any material when there's multi-axial stresses. Now one of the biggest places we see multi-axial stresses is underwater. So let's imagine that the stress in the x the stress in the y and the stress in the z, they're all the same. They're all pressure. Now, if we make that substitution, we see that the dilation is 1 minus 2 nu over E times 3P. A reminder that pressure is always positive, but it's compressive, so you're going to have a negative sign in here. Or if we wanted to rewrite that, we'd say it's negative 3, 1 minus 2 nu over E times P. This amount right here, it's just a component of the material you're looking at. Being an engineer, we assign some arbitrary coefficient to that. We call it K because it kind of is like a spring constant, and we define it as E over 3 times 1 minus 2 nu. And this basically tells us how much is this material going to compress when we apply pressure to it. With that definition, E equals negative P over K. So the dilation of a material is directly related to the pressure of the fluid it's in, and it's dependent on the characteristics of the material itself. In summary, dilation tells us how much the volume of a particle changes per unit volume, and it's easy to see using Hooke's Law in multi-axial applications. If you're interested, you can keep playing the video, and we're going to play around with this and see if we can 
kind of make get a little better feel of it. So for instance, let's pretend that the Poisson ratio is one half. Now, if the Poisson ratio is one half, we're going to have a denominator that goes to zero. So this k value is going to go way up. We're going to have a huge k value, which means that there's a huge k value in the denominator here. So a big pressure change will mean a really small dilation. Let's see if we can think that through. Well, we can imagine that we're going to apply some sort of force in the x direction. And as a result of that force, we have an axial strain, but we're also going to have some sort of lateral strain. And that lateral strain, it's going to be pretty big. As a matter of fact, the lateral strain is half of the axial strain. We can imagine we apply some sort of force in the x direction, and we have strain both vertically and depth-wise. Now at the same time, let's imagine that we apply, we'll, we'll uh, you know, give this thing depth. We're going to apply some sort of compression force in the z direction, all right? Now that force in the z direction, that's going to follow, fall some sort of compression in the z direction. But in addition, we'll say in pink, it's also going to cause some additional strain in the y direction. See in pink how it's making it even longer? Finally, in the y direction, we're going to apply a force. Well, check this out. Each one right here and right here, each one of those is half the strain in the x and in the y. In other words, if we apply in the, z, in the y direction the same force that's going on here, we will counteract the lateral strain that's already there. That means we're just going to push it back to where it was. And we can run this argument in each of the three directions. Basically what's happening is the force in the x direction is causing one half a unit of strain in the y direction. Force in the z is causing half a unit of strain in the, z, in the y direction. And the force of y now is going to fight that and bring it back to exactly where it was. So we can see that if the Poisson ratio is one half, we're going to end up with a material that no matter what the Young's modulus is, it is not going to experience any dilation when it's submerged in a fluid. Now let's take the opposite view. Now let's imagine that we're going to make K really small. So if K is really small, that means there's going to be a di big dependence between pressure and the dilation. And the way to make K really small is to make the Poisson ratio zero. Now, if the Poisson ratio is zero, we apply some sort of force on this particle. And as a result, we get some sort of strain just in the X direction. Nothing's going on in the Y direction. Likewise, we can put this you know, box in the z direction, apply some sort of force, and we're going to see strain in the z direction, but in the vertical direction, in the y direction, nothing's going on. What that means is that when we apply, let's say in pink, when we apply some sort of force in the y direction, it does not have to fight any strain. In other words, if we had had, say, some sort of lateral strain due to the force in the x direction, the force in the y would have to fight that, but it doesn't. And so what that means is that all the stress in the y direction is going to change the volume. In other words, all the force in the y direction will contribute to dilation. Therefore, we'll see a bigger dilation. So when the k value is lower, we see a bigger relationship between pressure and dilation. A quick survey of the math, we can identify the boundaries of the Poisson ratio, and I hope this gives you an intuitive feel of what's going on when a component is submerged in some sort of pressurized fluid.